All right, guys, welcome to chapter five, section five, one of the most important of this entire chapter and the remainder of this course, which again, we know is not much left. So as you hopefully have read through these notes a little bit, there's not much in addition to what we've already talked about and know, but this is a very important section for us for the following semester of Calc, Calc 2, and even on into third semester, okay? So the nice thing is that we were able to streamline how we found that area under the curve we called the antiderivative and gave it the symbol of that elongated S called an integral, the technique calling, uh, calling it integration. So that Riemann sum technique was no good, told us what we were actually finding, but then we were able to come up with a much more smooth and simpler way, and that was for integrating and over some interval. We called it a definite integral. So the things that we're going to be talking about now is integrating things with that fundamental theorem part two, the definite integral. But unfortunately, if you guys remember, something that kept coming up in chapter three, when we learned differentiation or taking the derivative, that process, there was these things called chains. Remember that? That chain rule was tough because that's when we had functions inside of other functions. And of course, since we did it with differentiation, it's going to come back with integration. And so we don't want to add on just a bunch more rules and add on to that big old long sheet that we already had for differentiation and then going the other direction, integration. So we're going to learn a new technique. You could probably guess what it's called. And what is substitution? Well, you may remember from algebra when there were very complex, even in trig, we did a little bit. When there are very complex looking things that we're dealing with, typically equations, then we wanted to sometimes use an alternative thing, which we typically called U. Remember those U substitutions? Where we saw it looked like it was possibly something that we could factor, but the form of it was just nasty. So we took what that nasty thing was that was being squared or raised to the fourth power and made it look a little bit simpler by using that U substitution. But then when we factored and did all the things that we had to do, like set it equal to zero and solve, remember, we didn't start with U. So we had to go back to our X, and I know that sounds bad, all right? But we had to go back and use what we initially substituted or called our U so that we could do what they originally gave us to solve for, which was typically some x. All right. So remember to work towards why we're doing what we're doing, and of course the how. But the better you understand why, the easier the how will be. So let's get to what these things kind of look like in our notebook here. And let's start going the direction that we started with for the previous two chapters, chapters three and four, and then we'll get to the integration of it by just writing it this direction. What if I gave you a generic function inside of a function? Do you guys remember how we took the derivative of those functions? Where did we always start? The interior. So we started with the inside function in here? No, we start with f of g of x. That's right. We actually started on the outside. Let me give you an example. Remember, let's say we had sine of 2x. And that was my function, right? What would we do to take the derivative of that? The dy dx or y prime, we said. Well, we take the derivative. Remember the big picture we said? the derivative of the outside function, which would be cosine of that thing, 
But then the chain that it was connected to is we then had to do the inside as well because we haven't taken the derivative of the whole piece yet. So then we had two as well. All right. So thank you for testing everyone, Austin. Just making sure they're paying attention. That's right. Okay. We are going to do the same thing, but in general, we will start with the outside, which means it will look like F prime. It's the simplest way to write it, right? Of the inside. But then we also have to take the derivative of the inside function. And so if you notice, the derivative of this is that. So I'll write it again up here. But what we are trying to do in chapter five is undo the derivative. Remember, we called it the antiderivative, and the symbol we gave it was this, called an integral. And therefore, we called that process of doing the antiderivative integration. So if I then gave you this and had you undo these derivatives, then that should give us back what we started with. So again, just taking the right side and doing that. Fundamental theorem part one. Remember, we can do whatever we want to an equation. So if we want to undo the derivative, that's what the fundamental theorem said we should get. Now notice there is one extra additional piece, and that was the possibility of there being a constant, that when we take the derivative, it disappears. So since this technically is our derivative, then we're saying that it would have started with this but it also could have had this, that when we took the derivative, you didn't see. No pun intended. Maybe a little. You guys know me by now. So what is this going to look like for us? Well, that's the one big theorem, not just for this section, but for this chapter moving forward. Okay, make sure you highlight this. It is the namesake of this section, the substitution method. Now notice it says in parentheses with indefinite integrals, which means if it's indefinite, it's what? Now Austin's afraid to speak. That means not defined, okay? And if it's not defined, that means we don't have an interval because remember, Although this says take the antiderivative or integrate, what does it actually find for us? Area under the curve. Thank you, Dustin. That's right, buddy. The area under the curve from A to B. And again, if you don't see that, then you're going to have to put the possibility of that constant being there. Okay? So indefinite integral. Now, this is pretty nasty, right? You guys are looking at this, and you're like, oh, shoot. Soraya talked about it last week. Okay, well, if there's nothing else really, then does that mean they're going to get harder? And she knew it was. It was a rhetorical question. She knew the answer already. She just was hoping that I would say, nope, we're done. That's it. But unfortunately, here we are. Because we now know how to integrate and we now know what it finds for us area under the curve as dustin mentioned well now we need to look at another level and that is when we have a function inside of a function and therefore also have the derivative of that so let's make this look better what is the ugliest thing on there well i'm okay with the outside function what we don't prefer is that inside function. So let's choose something that everyone likes. And hey, who doesn't like you? That's what we're going to decide to use as our substitution. And we're going to call whatever's inside. We're going to call that our U. 
So the good news is what you guys have always been wanting to say to me, now you get to write down. We can rewrite this as F you f excuse me f of you okay but that also means that if we have f of you what else are we going to have to have well notice what all this would therefore be if we let u equal g of x then what can i do to this equation i can do whatever i want we know that but what do we also want valerie you're going to chime in du that's right we want the do the du now remember if i take the derivative i got to take it with respect to something and since this is in terms of x we'll take the derivative of both sides with respect to x but we only want it in terms of u we're getting rid of all the x's finally i know all right so that means I'm going to go ahead and multiply over by this dx to this side. So that my du will be equal to the derivative of g of x times the derivative of x, or dx. And I don't know if you guys recall, back in chapter 4, we called these things something. Those little tiny dy's dx's or delta y or delta x differences very good that's right those were those differentials you guys remember that way back we actually worked to find what the actual values of these things would be okay so that's part of the reason that we did that so that you can see them as entities and not just one whole thing Okay, so if I go to find the derivative of this with respect to x, then what I'm going to do is multiply over by that dx. So that I get my du is equal to the derivative of this, which I can write much simpler like that, times dx. And do you guys notice that's exactly what this is, isn't it? And therefore, I can call that whole thing what? Do you? That's right. Very good, Caesar. So now we are going to rewrite this as the integral of f of u times du. Which means what are we asked to do? Integrate this function, which remember is just the area under a curve where we have our length and we have our width, but now it's all with respect to u instead of all this nastiness over here of x. And we know the antiderivative is just going to be that capital F plus a possible constant. But remember, we didn't start with u. So we got to go back to the original, which is what they gave us as an X. And so although we substituted in that U in blue right here early on and made sure that we had the width, its derivative, once we did the integration of the much simpler form than what we originally were given, we do the integration, we get that antiderivative, that capital F of the lowercase f. It's still in terms of u. All we got to make sure is that we replace back with what we let u equal. And if you go back over here and you have to look through and you're trying to figure out what the heck did you call u, it's much easier if you just put it over here, off to the side. Okay? So that's exactly what we are going to do. And we are going to therefore say that we got capital F, the antiderivative of our lowercase of, what do we say U was? That inside function that Austin made sure that we were paying attention about. And don't forget if it's a integral, 
that is undefined from A to B, then we have to put our possible C as a constant. Okay. Now, of course, we do want to actually find the area under curve sometimes from A to B of these chain rule integration problems. So if you look at your notes, does everybody have that part there? If you look at the next page of your notes, that's the next part is substitution, but with what kind of integrals? Definitely. Definitely. Very good, Dustin, which means it is defined over some interval for this integral. Meaning that we are going to actually not just find the antiderivative, which is all we did here, we're actually going to find what? Don't make Dustin say it again, you guys. Come on. Okay, go ahead, Dustin. The area under curve. That's right. The area under the curve from where to where? A to B. Now, here's the kicker, you guys. If we go back to this chain, where we're trying to make it look simpler with this substitution method. What do you think you're usually going to call, Austin? I'm looking at you. What do you think we're usually going to call you? Um, uh, G of X. Very good. That inside function. Hopefully you weren't just reading that. But no, yes. No, no. Good, the inside function, because then we have our outer function that we can rewrite as much simpler, f of u. But here's the problem. Dustin said, all of this is in terms of x, right? And he said, we're gonna go from a to b, which guess what those are in terms of? That, our original function which happens to be a nasty chain. So how can we rewrite this? Let's start with the indefinite integral. How would I rewrite this? The integral of what? Make sure you have the of in there, please. F of u. Oh, thank you for you. including the of, Caesar. Appreciate it. F of u, then what do we want? Uh, the du? Yeah, we want the derivative of u as well. And if we call this u, then we know what is the derivative of u. Well, it would be the derivative of that thing times the derivative of the in inside thing, multiplying over that dx. So this is what I always do on every single one of these. I write this off to the side. So I'm going to do that for you right now. And if we let u equal g of x, as Austin said, then, like Caesar said, if we take the derivative of that and we multiply over that dx, do you see what we get to replace this with? to look a lot simpler. F of u times what is all of this? It's just du. You guys, doesn't this look so much better than that? That's all this section is about, is substituting in and you get to choose. No pun intended. You get to choose your U. But as mentioned, what is it normally going to be? Don't say G of X, because what the heck is that, right? What is it normally going to be? The inner function. That's right. The inside function. Very good, Caesar. So 
here's the kicker. Do I just get to put A and B here as well? If you changed all of this to that, do you think that these just stay the same? Yeah. You wish, Soraya. If you changed all of this to use, normally we typically deal with X's, right? Well, then these are in terms of X. Remember, those are the x-axis values that we are saying we're going to find the area under our curve, as Dustin mentioned. So guess what you're going to have to do, which is why I always do this off to the side whenever I see something nasty for my integral. I got to also replace my upper and lower limits. And how? If you replaced all of this stuff with U and DU, then I want these in terms of U. And don't you already know what U is equal to? Then guess what you're going to do with this? G, B, G, A. Very good. And I'm going to highlight this. I'm going to put it in a different color up here. It's going to be, that's what our upper limit of U would be equivalent to. Plug in that B for X, which is what it is, and find what your U is for the upper limit, the one up top. What are you going to do for the lower? Same thing. Plug it in for what it is, the X, to get it in terms of U. Not the DU, but the U. So that's right. It would be G of A. Um, so why can't we just put it in f of g of x and g prime of x and then do the math that way? Like, why are we taking it another step and then doing the same thing there? I'm glad you read the notes before you showed up today, Sarai. I didn't. <laughs> because you're exactly right. We have two options. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. And that's what I said, I'll show and provide explanations for both techniques. Because you're absolutely right. What if I don't want to change these? But keep in mind, Sarai, why did we change them? Why did we change all of this? Because it's all of that. It's nasty. Look at this. Doesn't this look simpler? No, it looks nasty at the integral sign now. I okay. Did. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, you're and you're right. You're right. You're, you're totally right. But even though this is going to be, say, a five and this would be a one or a zero or whatever, all I'm going to really do is plug in and find what G of five is. I'm going to plug in and find what G of one is. And if you plug in a number, guess what you're going to usually get out? G, B, and G, A. A number. So even though they look nasty, these are still just going to be numbers. But what my point is, is they're gonna be different numbers. Yeah. And this allows us, by changing our upper and lower limits, it allows us to not have to go back after we find F of capital U. And then using our B and A, if we were to use these, guess what we'd have to do with our U? we'd have to go back and plug in our G of X again to that antiderivative so that you can use your B and A, which are also in terms of X. I'd rather not do that. But I'll show you both ways. Let me finish writing this down. But great point, Soraya. If we do the antiderivative of little f of U, DU, again, my length times my width of all those rectangles that this was the sum of from there to there. Then I know I would have capital F of the U from G of B to G of A, which is just equivalent to F of G of B, 
minus f of g of a. Or what else would you have to do? If you didn't want to change your a and your b, we could still use this by rewriting it. But now I would have to do, and I'm not going to do all the same steps, right? But still have to do our substitution method. But if I wanted to keep it with A and B now, then what would we have? We would then take the antiderivative and get capital F of, instead of U, we'd have to plug in G of X from A to B. Okay. If you guys want me to write every step I can, is everybody okay with me skipping the this part to this part? We're just going here. So now I got everything in terms of x, which means I can use my x interval. So I know it looks shorter when I do it like this, so I probably should have written all of it out, but it's actually more work. And if you notice, what did we ultimately end up at? The exact same thing. It's just a matter of keeping the U, which means changing your upper and lower limits to be in terms of U, or keeping your interval in X's, which means you've got to get rid of the U and put it back in terms of X. So by the way, you're still going to have to do this process, right? You're still going to have to rewrite it so that you can integrate this. You're not going to be able to see what the original function would have been most of the time. So you're going to have to do what is called a U substitution. Okay. That's the definite integrals versus the indefinite so again just to try to give you more explanation you guys have this in front of you you can read it but just make sure that whether you keep the x or the u you change your limits accordingly All right now there is one issue that we will run into okay but i'm not going to give you an example of the generic of it because it changes all the time but sometimes when you are given a function that you're asked to integrate that has the chains every once in a while and this happens sometimes more than off uh, than not and you sometimes have to also look at what you are given to really decide what you should call you but sometimes you'll be missing a part of the du. And that means that you may have to multiply by a, anybody know? Fancy one. Very good. You might have to multiply by a fancy one to get that thing. And remember, because the antiderivative and the derivative are just limits, you can take a part of that fancy one, that constant, and move it out in front. All right, so let me show you what I mean by this. Everybody take a look at part A. Let's do that one together. On number one, it is the antiderivative of the cosine of 
x squared as our angle, and then it's multiplied by 2x dx. Do you guys know what we originally would have had that when we took the derivative, we got this? Because that's what this is asking, right? What is the antiderivative of that? Sine. Definitely. X squared. Plus. Maybe. And that's the part that we're not sure about. Very good, sir. I, you know that if we had sine, it's going to have to be of that, right? Because when I take the derivative of this, that's how I get cosine of that angle. But what else would we have to have? If we're taking the derivative of that, what would it be? Times 2x. Good. And then the dx, remember, is just the length times the width of this thing. It's the dy dx multiplied over the dx part. So yeah, some of these are easy to see as Soraya saw, but I'm gonna show you the way to do these always when they're not so easy. And so I gave you a bunch of different examples in the notebook. I want you all to go off to the side and do this every single time. Okay, and when are you gonna use this? When are you gonna use this substitution? Don't just say 5.5. When it looks nasty like that. Very good. And not just when it looks nasty, but more importantly, when you don't know how to take the antiderivative or integrate this. Very good, Caesar. So what are we going to call you? Cosine x squared. Okay. If you're going to call Dustin cosine x squared. X squared Forget about what we have over here. Concentrate on this right now. Then what would you need? You would need the derivative of that. And what is the derivative of cosine x squared? Negative sine 2x, x squared times 2x. Do we have all of that here? No. So then guess what? That's the wrong you. Now, remember, I gave you guys a hint. Caesar helped us out to solidify what it should be. What typically, almost always, should you be looking at calling you? The inner function. You got to look inside to see what you're going to call you. You guys got that? And the inside function is that. That is the x squared. Now, again, let's start over and say, okay, if that's what I'm calling u, let's take the derivative of both sides. And obviously over here, we get du over dx. And then what is the derivative of x squared? It's just 2x. And then we're going to multiply this over so that we just have things in terms of u on the left, in terms of x on the right. And if we let x squared be that, then I see the 2x multiply over the dx. Does everybody see my du here? And my u there? Then can we rewrite it in a simpler form? Um. And write it as the cosine of u du. Go ahead, Sarai. Why am I writing the dx after 2x? Like, like after for du, why am I writing 2x multiplied by dx? Yeah, great question. I'm I'm trying to not clutter the beautifulness of the writing here. Okay. So I did it to both sides of my equation. I wanted the du. So I took the derivative of this with respect to x, and we took the derivative of this with respect to x. Yeah. And so on this side, we had the du over dx. On this side, the derivative of that is just this. You got that? Yeah. But I only wanted the u's by themselves. So I multiplied over the dx to both sides to just have the u's on one side of my equations and the x's on the other. Great question. 
So now if I gave you this, should you all know it immediately? What is the antiderivative of cosine of u? If this is your length and your width of all those rectangles, what original function that when we take the derivative gives us this? Sine of u. Now, do I need to write this? The sine of u? Sorry. What I just wrote there? Uh, no. No, because we are doing the antiderivative of this. Okay, so don't just keep writing that beautiful elongated S just because you want to. Okay, we are going to say the antiderivative of this is what? Sine of U. Is that right? Is that it? Why not? What am I missing? The negative sign. In substitution. Not only the substitutions, what else? Plus. The constant. The possible constant. So once I have done the anti-differentiation or integration for short, how do you know if this is correct, everyone? Do you remember? If this is the anti-derivative, then just say, what if I took the derivative? I should get this. So you can always kind of do it in your head and check. The derivative of this is cosine of u, perfect. Derivative of this, zero. And remember, the derivative of sine of u is cosine of u times du. See, it's still there. If you want to put plus zero for that, it's all good, but we don't write nothing, it does nothing. So as Dustin mentioned, we are going to have to do one last thing to finish. And that is, look, I don't have to go figure out what I called you up here. I have it written right here. So my final answer for this would be sine of x squared plus c. Now, again, this is 1a. This is the very first one. It's super easy. I hope you guys feel that way as well. But it's that way for a reason. I wanted to just get you guys started. And then I'm going to give you several different looks, increasing in difficulty. Okay, everybody okay with that? No, it's going to take some time. Okay. But don't be afraid to make mistakes. As Dustin mentioned at the beginning, he was like, all right, it's cosine. But if you're going to call u cosine, you're going to have to have what for du? negative sign. And guess what? Sometimes you're going to have that. And you may not even have the negative, which means what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to multiply by a fancy one. You're going to have to put a negative one on the outside and on the inside. Because what is a negative one times a negative one? Positive one, it's a fancy U. What if you're missing the two? What if they didn't have that there? Well, you have to have it. If this is your U, then guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna multiply by two and a half. It's a fancy one, but I only want the two there. So guess what you're gonna do with that constant? You're gonna pull it out in front which means you will have this, you will have this, and that would then be your final answer. Don't shake your head no, Dustin. Yeah, it's not that bad, but it is different. All right, so you'll see some of those in there as you guys start working through these. All right, but that's it for this section. We'll go ahead and move on to the next unless anybody has any questions. All right, then here is 5.6, the last section for today. This one, pretty self-explanatory because it's not anything new like what we just went over. In this section, it's all just in addition to all the integration stuff that we talked about in chapter five. 
but now it's going to involve those exponential and logarithmic functions. And again, should we already know all of the derivatives of exponential and logs? Yeah, we went over them. Do you remember them? Maybe some. Which ones in particular? Which exponential and which logarithmic? E to the power x. Yep. And what about for logs? The natural log of x. Naturally. Very good, Jeremiah. Notice they both have the base of E because those were the easiest ones for us to work with. But unfortunately, there are other bases. So we won't just work with E. And I don't know if you guys remember those derivatives, but for this section, there's not much to add to it. Okay. I'm just going to give you these definitions. We'll talk about a few that you definitely should know. All right. But other than that, I will give you these. And that's it. It's literally that short. There's nothing new, really. It's just remembering to now go the other direction. And of course, now that we've seen 5.5, the U substitutions, U subs for short, instead of just X, what could be in any one of these things? Another function, call it G of X or call it for easier, U. Okay, so let me give you guys these and then I'll field any questions and that'll be it for today. We'll start working on these examples to make sure that we got it down, all right? What is the antiderivative of E to the X? E to the X? I'm glad that everybody spoke up. Don't forget though, because it is not defined, you don't see the A and the B, you're gonna have to put the constant. And again, the only thing that may change is instead of those things being X's, they may have another function up there. The cool thing is, what is the antiderivative of that? It's the same. The only difference is you're going to have to have that, which may require some creativity. Question, comment, Sarai? Um, if that's the antiderivative, shouldn't it be like, shouldn't it, shouldn't the first part, like the blue part, be e to the power u times u? No, so remember, just like we had here, right? If we're questioning whether or not this is indeed correct, then we could take the derivative of this to see if it's actually the antiderivative. And what is the derivative of e to the x? It's e to the x, but then we'd also have to take the derivative of x. But let's say if we had e to the power 2x, the derivative would be e to the power x times two oh, oh 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 got it i keep forgetting about that part all good remember that i'm just mentioning hey just because this is 5.6 doesn't mean 5.5 can't be enthralled in it we're just focusing on the exponential functions and then the logarithm now i don't know if you guys remember if this was what the derivative gave us do you remember what gave us the a to the x do you remember the one subtle difference? Log. Yeah, very good. What log and where? It was just like E, but E is special. Any log with that base that we talked about, we said our favorite log for this exponential is E. So I don't know if you guys remember, we actually had to multiply by 
the natural log of a to divide it out, to get rid of that denominator, so to speak. So you won't see this one as much, but I wanted to make sure that you at least had it in your notes. What definitely matters? This one. Or with that substitution of a u function. Okay, this is the only additional part. You can still think of it as e to the u. It's still e to the u, but since it's not e, you're going to have to divide out by the natural log, which, oh, by the way, if you put an e in here, what happens? It's one? Yep. Because the bases are the same, it would just cancel out and you would get one, which is why it's just e to the x. So this actually holds for all exponential functions. It's just easier to not and remember it as this. As long as you have a base of E. Okay, so I'm not even going to circle this one because we don't see it much, but have it in your notes, have it in your repertoire to look up. This is the one that you will see and utilize the most. Which is good, because then we don't have to worry about that. What do you guys see this as? Most of you don't see it as a logarithm. How come? It's ln x. There's no log. <laughs> but Sarai is already seeing what original function she would have had to have had to get this. Because we <laughs> had it in our homework for 5.4 or something. That's right. But not everybody does the homework, but I'm glad you did, Sarai, because you already saw this. Now, notice, if you tried to do it, power rule to this you would add one to the power and divide by that power but what is a negative one when you add one undefined a zero that is a zero which when we divide by a zero you're right it's undefined so as many of you were mouthing it's a zero that's why this cannot even though it's looking like a power rule with that negative one up top this is a special case. So let me do you a favor and let me rewrite it. And actually move it to the opposite side and put one over x dx. Now do you guys see what my original function would have had to have been in order to yield that as the derivative? What would it have to be? Soraya already said it. Somebody else give me one. A uh, natural log of x. Very good. Now, don't forget when we graphed the natural log at the very, very beginning when we were doing review stuff of some of the pre-calculus that we should already know. Do you remember the graph of the natural log? And I know it's been a long time since we've talked about this. But... It had that vertical asymptote, and then it had the 0 0.10, and then if it was increasing, it went from left to right upwards, decreasing downwards. Remember that? It's been a while. That's why I'm reviewing it with you. Why did I bring that up? Well, remember with logs, if the y-axis was our asymptote, our borderline, and it went really, really far down, but not past zero, and then it went through the point one zero and then gradually went up what does that mean our x's can only be uh, positive that's right and what can we put around that x to ensure that we can actually take the natural log of any input absolute value absolutely guys well done so that is just a precautionary thing because we don't know how to take the natural log of anything else.
So that is a special case that you guys need to recognize is just one over. Well, in case we get some of the 5.5 instead of X, what it might it be? One over U D U. You may have to call something else down there, a U instead of it just being an X. And they can disguise it like this. Don't let it. Don't let it fool you. Okay, but otherwise, you'll flat out see the logs. But I'm telling you right now, you will see this more than either of these two. Because do you remember an original function that gave us the natural log when we took the derivative? Good, you shouldn't. Not just because you didn't work hard in that section, but there wasn't anything. So I can go through the why and everything else, but I'm just gonna give them to you. They're pretty nasty, which again is why we won't see these as much as we will see this and this. It is equal to x times the natural log of x minus one. Oh, and with the possible constant. Now, if you wanted to actually go through with this, that obviously goes to zero. But if you wanted to check whether the derivative of that gives you this, go for it. I'm not going to do that with you. Hopefully, you'll just take my word for it. You would have to do a product rule, my friends. Good review there. First derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And you would get some things to cancel out to actually give you this. Where did they come up with that? Reverse engineering. All right, well, if I'm going to have this, I'm going to need this. And if I only have that, then it's going to just become this. So that's why they said, well, there's going to have to be something else multiplied by it so that I will be able to keep a natural log. And that's where that product comes into play. So why x to the first? Because when you take the derivative of that, it becomes one, and that's where the natural log of x stays. Okay, but I'm going to just leave it at that. Again, I'm not even going to circle this because you're not going to see it that much. Just look it up if you ever do see an integral with a natural log. And of course, even less seen, a regular log with a regular, any base greater than zero, not one. All those rules still apply. Well, it's almost exactly this because the only thing that has changed from this to this is that this was a base of E and this is saying it could be any base. That's positive and not one. So what do you think changes here? Oops, sorry, I left off the X. What's the only thing that we got to do to kind of get rid of the natural log? Just like we did up above. That's the only difference. And of course, don't forget your plus C possibility. Look those up if you need them. Now that you have them in your notes, which ones do I want to make sure that you focus on? Obviously, the ones that I've highlighted. That one. And that one. And of course, what can we have instead of just one over x dx? One over u du. Which means we would have an answer of
either way. Just a matter of what you have inside of those functions. That's all I got for you. All we got to do now is practice to make sure that we got this down. You guys got about an hour and 15 minutes to get it done.